Hi, hello and welcome. Um, this is uh, the Beamer broadcast for um, the, the Creative Council. For those of you that don't know, Beamer is formed of a series of councils which kind of help kind of drive the, the, the agenda forwards. This is uh, part of the Creative Council, as I mentioned, and one of the things that we are doing is to have a service called Beamer Beat. And what we wanted to do with Beamer Beat was to, um, if you like, socialize and showcase all the great work that's happening in the UK that's kind of coming out from the kind of digital end of things. So using digital technologies, applying uh, creativity and really help kind of service that community. Because what we've seen over the last few years is that um, where we used to be doing this on a regular basis, we, we're now seeing a number of annual award shows. And that given, if you like, the nature of being able to publish to Instagram and other channels, that people a like a bit of feedback immediately, uh, whether that's positive affirmation or kind of comment to make things better and waiting a year to be awarded something um, for a lot of people just doesn't work. So Beamer, with Beamer Beat, we've divided this down into three months. Um, it's free to enter. We've made the entry process really simple. You simply uh, complete a couple of fields on a Google Doc and then our creative um, council leaders, we sit down, we review the work and we produce our um, selection um, and then we'll kind of award the piece that we feel kind of best represents what we're kind of looking for. We've been doing this around a series of themes. So our first theme was a reimagine. Then we had uh, reduce, which is quite timely in terms of looking to say that marketing is often about driving uh, consumption, but actually, you know, what pieces of digital communications or product design or ecosystems can we be using to help people kind of, you know, reduce something which might be around consumption, it might be around energy usage, it might actually be reducing hate or reducing um, a particular, um, you know, dependency on a controlled substance or, you know, it's quite broad there. And so um, we released the information around that on our Instagram channel a few weeks ago. Uh, and this, this session is related to formula announced that we're going to be talking about reset as a, our theme. Now, we decided on that theme quite a few months ago, and um, you know, one might say it was quite prescient, but I think the world has changed somewhat in that time. And also this need or this feeling that we are about to have a reset, or we do need to take opportunities uh, that um, because of the situation we're in to kind of do a drive a better reset. So we're looking for really interesting work, the big and the small, from, from student through to you know, big agency or big business brand that kind of represents reset. Um, and if you, we're going to put the links in the, the in the chat, so you can go to our Instagram page and also the website to get more details about it. But welcome to Beat and our four amazing speakers. So what I'd like to do is going to kick off um, and introduce you to Hugo of the Restart Project, and we're going to talk a little bit about what he's been kind of doing and why he feels that uh, with a name like kind of you know Restart is very applicable to what we're doing with our reset theme. And I think try and inspire us to think about things differently. And one of the things that's consistent in terms of digital is often the devices that we're using either to communicate or to do the work. And often we don't think about what's happening with these um, devices or how they might have built in obsolescence, or in fact, they might be quite difficult to repair. And Hugo is gonna tell us quite a bit more about that and why it's important, but not just the hardware devices about how this kind of comes into software and the way that we're thinking about this in terms of the overall value chain, uh, supply chain rather, and how we kind of uh, understand that value exchange. So you go over to you. It'd be great for you to just introduce yourself um, to the team. Uh, it's weird when you're looking at a blank screen. I hopefully you can kind of all hear us and uh, we'll ask a few questions about this. So uh, take it away. Thanks, Simon. Uh, so my name is Ugo Valauri and I'm co-founder and policy lead at the Restart Project. We are a charity and a social enterprise based in London that's been pushing to, well, inspire people to rethink their relationship with electronics by focusing on the value in the devices we already have and inspire people to repair and reuse and learn a bit more about what's inside our devices. And increasingly, in the context we set, um, it's not just about restarting a device, but it's changing the system that dictates currently how our products are um, through a too fast 
uh, basically. And uh, more and more, we are working on uh, a concept that's taking uh, more and more visibility globally, and it's called right to repair. And so how do we change the system to ensure that future products will be more repairable than the current ones, so that less electrical and electronic waste is generated, less natural resources need to be extracted uh, from via mining around the world and less uh, low, uh, poorly retributed jobs uh, across the world around manufacturing uh, need to be uh, exploitative in making of these devices and how can we ensure that products last longer we make the most of them and we prevent unnecessary waste cool so i think really you know interesting uh, initiative and uh, you know we, we we talk a lot about sustainability and we talk about a lot about kind of climate change and that, but i think you know we still have a something of a throwaway culture and, you know, what we've seen, obviously, um, over the last few months is an increase in e-commerce and lots of packaging kind of being used. But again, if you know that's, you can imagine that can be to an extent recycled. But I think when we're starting to talk about more complex artifacts, whether it's a piece of machinery, you mentioned the computers, but also um, typically um, vacuum cleaners, I know, don't last as long as they used to do, you know, washing machines, etc. But it'd be interesting to hear from you because... There is a move towards more recycling, but this idea of a closed loop recycling. So I might, cars are a good example. I think 80% 80, 80 of a car plus needs to be recycled. And so in theory, you know, you can take the device, crush it all up, extract all the raw materials and then feed them into your manufacturing process. But it'd be interesting to hear from you, you know, why that is perhaps not the best solution and why we should be repairing before we were re recycling. And kind of in your mind, a what's the difference, and why you know being able to repair is so important. So the the key aspect of all of this is that uh, while recycling import is important, it's not going to save us from the mountain of waste that we produce. And the reason for that is that, particularly with the context of electrical waste, um, the vast majority uh, of the uh, earth uh, materials that are used for specific electronics are not efficiently recyclable to begin with. And the <clears throat> main environmental impact of these products lays within the manufacturing phase. So in environmental terms, the best thing to do with a product is to extend its use phase without having to go through an energy inefficient recycling and remanufacturing process. Mm -hmm. So just to give you an example, your typical smartphone, between 70 and 80% of its overall environmental impact happens before you ever switched it on. And so the only way to uh, reduce our impact has actually has to do with learning to consume less new products and extending the amount of time we spend on the products that we already have. And that's not just about uh, smartphones, it's about everything, uh, minus a couple of big appliances uh, whose energy efficiency increases over time with better designs and so that you can recoup um, the energy uh, within factory by using less energy when you use that fridge, for example. But it's it's not the same for every product. Yeah. Because I think you know we're where people are getting excited about the if you like the increase in electrification. You know, we talk about Tesla and the cars, but that's a probably a great example about how battery technology is a, quite a problem for us, right? In certain especially lithium iron. So uh, the more batteries that we have, that requires very specific raw materials, which to your point are expensive to mine and also quite dangerous in the way that they are mined. Um, do, you know, do you see, if, have you, you know, how, how do you see about trying to kind of fix that, especially a kind of battery technology thing, which is quite a bespoke um, and quite a specific, uh, if you like scientific thing, so an engineering challenge. Yeah, so 
uh, aside from the fact that then you know the more electrification also requires more questioning of where does that electricity comes from to begin with and how clean energy is not as pervasively available as you might want it to but there's definitely uh, more than can happen in terms of optimizing the the value that we get out of the existing batteries and how often products uh, that we do not know how to best manage the digital devices that are so pervasive in our uh, life so that we end up having uh, you know, cycling through a battery and reducing its capacity because maybe we leave our phone charging overnight as opposed to charging it just for the bare minimum that we need etc so there's there's a lot of issues that we need to become more aware of but certainly there is a bigger fight uh, around how to make sure uh, that we reverse the uh, tendency to make products that are less and less repairable and that last less and less and that's why uh, at global level, there's been an emergence of uh, campaigning around the right to repair. And it's not just about smartphones. I mean, uh, it is about our very, all of the devices that are in and around our lives. I mean, take even uh, game consoles, for example, you know, that's a market that has dominated by just three companies globally. And uh, it, the very um, manufacturers of these consoles actually are actively lobbying in the United States to prevent independent repairs from fixing their own PlayStation, their own Xbox. And uh, why? Because using often arguments that are extremely unfair and just simply wrong that people might want to load illegal software in these devices by repairing them and we are confronting and that's important in the context of resetting confronting like fake arguments from industry lobbyists that are just trying to save the status quo while even uh, business analysts are saying that right to repair is an agenda and i'm quoting from a webinar i attended a couple of days ago that's here to stay and that the world wants to repair more and manufacturers just have to change so i guess the values that we associate with repair longevity and caring about the products that we own uh, should also be reflected in a new relationship and a new way of communicating about this product, which I think is particularly relevant for our audience. I mean, we're, we're, we're sold uh, how sexy a device is. I'd love to be told how many years will the software of that device be supported for so that I can choose if I want to buy a smartphone supported for 10 years or one that's supported for two years, uh, such as all the Android devices, max three years at the moment. Why are they not supported for 10 years? Well, yeah, I think you could, you know, we used to get, you know, various kite, mar kite marks on uh, products, but actually, you know, some simple legislation which kind of demonstrates how long that product is going to be deemed valid for, right, in terms of uh, it's obsolescence and actually it should give you under normal service X years and also to be supported through the software that you mentioned. And I think the comment, just going back to the thing about the, the battery, I think that's quite an interesting uh, challenge for kind of creatives to be thinking about actually, how can I work as much as we kind of want batteries and everything to make them portable, you know, how do we kind of make that, um, you know, not, you know, not as much of a problem. So, you know, does it need a battery? And then also, how can we make sure that we can really um, lengthen the, uh, the, you know, the, the duration of not just the charge, but the way in which the chemicals within those batteries are not depleted at an alarming rate. And so actually you can get a, a good number of years out of the battery just by doing simple, whether it's through software or prompting or other devices, which I think um, is, a, is a really interesting way to be thinking about it. Um, There's you know, an extra, um, if you allow me, like an extra yeah. element of this, which is, uh, and that's one of the reasons that right to repair has become uh, so powerful, that people are tired of having devices where the battery simply is not replaceable. Yeah. 
or it's almost irreplaceable by way of design uh, because of applying glues rather than other um, uh, screws, for example, to, 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 to fix a device or um, because the manufacturer doesn't bother making the battery available, uh, a replacement battery. I mean, try to find vacuum cleaners of uh, uh, plenty of brands uh, in the UK and around the world. And it's, it's often just impossible. And that begs the question, why? Um, what, why are we designing products that way? Right to repair? Uh, its pillars are access for everyone for uh, devices that are easy to disassemble, that access for everyone to the spare parts that are needed to an, an extend their duration, and access for everyone of the repair manuals and all the schematics to do all of this. And of course, then there's the issue of software that will become more and more important as all of the smart connected devices uh, become more prominent. In a sense, if you don't have access to long-term software and security support, the concept of repairability becomes potentially less relevant because it's becoming more important that a product is fully supported for a longer period of time. No, I think, and, and you know, what we're also seeing is a move towards more services, subscriptions, so actually, the way that we might purchase, especially in terms of shared usage, um, you know, I, you know, means that we don't just need to think about products where I buy the thing and then I use it for a few years and then I, I kind of chuck it. So I think that that's that you know, there you know, now is a good time to be thinking about that. And I think you make a compelling argument. You know, one of the things that would be leveled about this is that you know we need to keep the economy going. We need to keep driving consumption. We need to, you know, what are the people that make all these products? And design all these products going to do if we're we have products that can be repaired but i know you have an, a, an interesting take on if you like the economic uh, impact of this especially in local communities as opposed to um you know ivory towers in uh, you know in far off lands yeah uh, the the key aspect is that there's a lot of uh, economic opportunity for local jobs in servicing and maintaining products uh, for a longer period of time. And this is a point that uh, needs further expansion because what we're seeing is now, for example, during the lockdown, repair businesses were not even seen as essential. So we've been maintaining a list in London of currently it's 25 repair businesses that we've been following that are still somehow open that accept uh, um, while well, their shop is shut, but they still continue to work. And I mean, many people cannot find, even not even during the lockdown, but in general, repair businesses in their locality are sufficiently accessible um, for keeping in operation the things that they have. And due to the design and lack of incent of products and the lack of incentive, financial incentives, we are seeing more and more repair shops shut. What we need is to reverse this, and that's why uh, Restart uh, started uh, together with partners a Manchester Declaration for uh, the Right to Repair. It's been now signed by 20 ally organizations and 50 uh, repair local repair groups across the whole of the UK and 10 NPs, and we want to expand this because we need to reduce all the current barriers to repair and unlock economic and other social opportunities across every city and every local area to reduce the amount of uh, stuff that goes to waste unnecessarily. And we're talking about about one fourth, uh, though this data is not that fresh, one fourth of all of the products that are brought to recycling uh, was actually reusable products that often end up there by mistake. And I, I'd like to take the point on consumption. Obviously, we need to uh, support local meaningful, real green jobs, but we certainly do not want to push for more consumption of resources and products. We want equal access uh, to products. And so we need better products that last longer designed to last high quality products and ensure their accessibility by everyone 
by ensuring that there is a second uh, hand market so that products can cycle through and be reused. Uh, and if they're high quality and repairable, people that might not be able to afford them new, they can afford a, a high quality second hand product, for example. Amazing. And also, we should um, actually look very critically at some of the language and the um, hype around the circular economy as it's been sold to us as as you say we're moving towards a more service-based uh, access to products but that doesn't mean that we're creating open opportunities for keeping products in um, use for longer uh, we're seeing the risk of a circular economy dominated by some large brands that can keep control of their products indefinitely uh, by not allowing third party and independent repair and reuse organizations to access spare parts and access the knowledge to con or the intellectual property to, to keep these products in operation. And so one big risk is that we're moving towards more of a monopoly based access that seems circular but not creating opportunities uh, across the values for particularly for internal reuse and repair products amazing and uh, super super interesting and apologies because we run over time a little bit but i think everyone hopefully that's given you a good taste of what the restart project is about the link to the website is in the comments it's the restartproject.org Hugo's given, a, I think, a very compelling kind of argument as to why we should be taking it seriously. And I think as creatives and creators, I think there's a lot in there for us to be thinking about and actually a kind of attacking and working with in a number of different areas, whether it's the product design or it's the kind of publicity, uh, you know, the kind of standards approach, whether it's about lobby lobbying around this, it's, whether it's about thinking about how we best communicate and um, these issues or the product design benefits in itself. And also I think a, a really interesting point about the second hand market, about how we're able to ensure that we are not just destroying an item and recycling it, but actually it's given often given new leases of life to kind of move it forward. So I'd like to say a big, sorry to wrap this up, but a big, big thank you. And uh, we'll move on to our next speaker. But yeah, the restartproject.org um, for more details. Amazing. Thanks very much for your time. So I'd like to now introduce Hanisha, who is the, uh, has just started a new business. She's co-founder of the, the Reset Sessions. Um, and we're thrilled to have her speaking to Beamer Beat. Uh, and really, obviously, with a business called Reset was like the perfect kind of guest to be uh, talking today. Uh, and we're just going to hear a little bit more about why um, th this business, what it's aiming to do, and about how we as an industry can kind of learn from it. So over to you, Anisha. Um, well, the Reset Sessions, like you said, is brand new, literally only launched a week ago. Um, but it's come about because we're in this crazy time. And actually, what's going on right now is businesses are floundering. They're not sure how to cope with the change in what people want from them. Black Lives Matter is, you know, a huge, a huge part of that most recently, but even then before that with the pandemic. Um, and my co-director, Nicholas Roop and I basically got together at the beginning of lockdown and we were discussing, you know, the, the repetitive messages on LinkedIn and all across social media which are all about how businesses need to come back and this whole idea of this new normal. Um, but no one was really talking about how to do it. And my experience combined with Nicholas's meant that actually we're really well placed to think about how to reset from a leadership team's point of view and to really think about how um, you can come back in a much more positive way than you left. And the idea that you know we're all a bit different now compared to where we were in January. We we care about different things, and taking that on board, it's only right that your brand and your culture has the time to adapt and flex to suit those needs. Cool. And um, so, I do. You, do you think that uh, had you been thinking about a business a year ago that you would have um, come up with the same business idea, or do you think? This is something that's been a slow burn or and a real passion, 
or actually because what's been happening in the last few months has really compelled you to kind of come forwards and you know and, and, and do this because I know you want to drive quite a radical agenda and you know you're sort of sick, you know you're sick of waiting in many ways and you know businesses need to change yeah I think um you know the two of us have drunk a lot of coffee moaning about this <laughs> so even before lockdown ever happened but right now what's happened is that we we just found ourselves in a position to help and really take advantage of this opportunity you know people don't move very quickly when they're comfortable and you know bravery really happens when you're fearful um, and now is a perfect time we feel that you know if everything is disrupted um, everything from your workplace to your marketplace while everything is disrupted this is a really good time to push forward with radical ideas and you know really get all the change sorted at once um no i i think you know we we hear quite a lot of stories you know businesses are having to adapt and and you know as you say make those changes and it's driven out of kind of fear or just pure necessity and i think you know we have been living with this idea of fail fast for 15 years perhaps yeah. um and i think as an industry you've just parroted a lot of these kind of phrases and in, in a way that just is glib and meaningless and i think that actually you know what you're doing is a great opportunity to you know to try going going to the boardroom and kind of drive this is what it means you've been saying this and you can apply that to a number of kind of issues you've been saying this for years now is the time yeah uh, i think that's great um i know when we spoke this, this idea of creativity and actually um that's something that you're, you're both very kind of passionate about and it'd be great to hear from you about how um, you, you know you can see this up you know what's happening now and this opportunity to help better unlock creativity within businesses yeah um, I think I think people forget how creativity can be um, much much more than an ad campaign or much more than just you know pencils and design um, and awards. I think it's much more about the way people think. And right now we all have to be creative. We have to be creative in our strategies, the way we reposition ourselves in terms of being relevant again. Um, so create, creativity is absolutely at the heart of what we're trying to do. Um, and people, you know, they forget, you forget once you're in that kind of leadership position, it's quite easy to forget um, how to do things differently. So many people, especially leaders that I've worked with, have just been stuck in a rut and have done things the same old way and expected, you know, different solutions. So for us, the, the opportunity is in us asking really kind of pointy and strategic creative questions to a team of really smart people and then teasing the answers out, um, which, uh, you know, is really exciting. It's good. I, I know that we talk about, you know, senior people and you know board level but i know that you are you know you believe that in many ways for businesses to change they need to do it from the you know the inside out and actually that internal audience yeah uh, is really important and i think that you know we, we've been speaking quite rightly a lot about diversity as a way of as a real business advantage and it would be great to to, to hear from you about the ways in which you know an internal audience we've had sam conliff was speaking you know he was talking about be more pirate and i know that that's part of his innovation agenda mm. and it'd be great to hear from you in terms of how that that you know how you capture that you know the internal audience you kind of you know, make sure that the business brings it with them and you know use their perhaps like their their fear um and uh, and ideas in a positive way to help make this kind of change happen to, to you know to help reset yeah totally so um i think i think a lot of this starts with how the teams are actually feeling and making sure that leadership understand, you know, what sentiment is going on in their organizations in the first place. How happy are they? Where, you know, what's, what's upsetting them? I think, if anything, Black Lives Matter and this recent, most recent movement has, has really taught us that people just still aren't listening. And it's so frustrating for me because I've been in this industry for quite a while now and still seeing this conversation of diversity and inclusion not move forward with any meaningful action is, is so annoying um but i think you know people forget the true meaning of diversity and why why it's important and that's because better ideas come from different minds 
um, you know, people with different backgrounds, different mindsets, different upbringing, all of that brings together a much more well-rounded idea and a, an idea that's sticky and relevant to many, many more people than just the people that look like the ones that are creating it. Um, and so for me, I think if you are looking at your teams and you feel like the, there's a voice in there that is much more powerful and could be that rallying cry that you need for an organization, don't be afraid that it's not yours. And you know, leaders right now should not be afraid to step aside and let those people take charge. Um, I think, and they should nurture that. You know, they should encourage it. No, I think it's, I know it's, you know, super important. You know, that diverse of thought, of expression, of presentation, and actually challenging. I, I was just, I was listening to a podcast, and actually, just before this, they were saying, you know, actually, as an advisor, it, they want that kind of tension. And actually, if you're finding people that always agree with you, it's a problem. And I think now, you know, if, you know, if you're a business, you're having to reset, you know, getting that, you know, a, a diverse kind of team of, you know, people to kind of work on things, I think is super important, right? And actually, if everyone's kind of looking like, you know, me, yeah, my guy with a beard, for example, <laughs> you know, you got, there's a problem, right? And I think, you know, we, you need to be applying that also, if, you know, as an individual, not just going to your default places of inspiration, whether that's DNA D awards or creative review, et cetera, but actually looking much further and farther afield and um, mm. to see what's kind of happening in, you know, culture and, and society. And I think it's a great place to be inspired by. Um, I know you, you know, think, thinking just to finish is that, you know, we talk about that internal team and driving that kind of change. Um, but actually, what are the core values uh, that you'd like to see coming through within an organization and making sure that, um, you know, we're perhaps putting words into your mouth here, but being, you know, human or customer first and how that kind of can kind of apply in this context and how, you know, we can make good on that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like I said, people have changed. And um, if you look at any, oh, OK, I'll use the example of Airbnb. You know, what does everyone remember about them right now? And it's not their last ad campaign. It's their letter from their CEO. And, you know, ultimately that was a redundancy letter, you know, but what that showed you was real human values. Um, and I think human values can be presented in the most mundane places and they really stand out. Um, you know, even with Ben and Jerry's and that whole statement against white supremacy, it was just brilliant. And who wouldn't be proud to work for Ben and Jerry's right now? Um, the human, the most human values are the ones that I want to see come through. They're the ones that really speak to us. They speak to us as people, not as marketers or, um, you know, drones that the world would like us to be. Um, I think, you know, the more human you can be and in leadership, I think it's also important to show vulnerability and show that you are open to failure and open to learning from your mistakes. Um, I think that will be really exciting. I think you make a really good point there around leadership and it feels, I mean, I think there are a lot of things that are changing, but it, it feels, you know, and, and Jacinda Hearn in New Zealand has been, uh, you know, lauded for their response, but it also feels that our idea of what it is to be a good leader is changing. And actually we're, we're you know, we're being more diverse in our opinion about what makes a good leader. And actually mm -hmm. the comment is, is, you know, being less about the actions and trying to look like a good leader, but being a good leader by, you know, driving that change by, you know, admitting, you're not always right by actually um, saying, what can I do for you as opposed to, I want you to do this. And uh, is that something that you'll be encouraging, you know, your, your clients to, 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 to challenge themselves in terms of their own, to reset their own leadership styles? Definitely. Um, and I think, you know, when you talk about fear, the antidote to fear is familiarity. And so the way to become familiar with a form of habit is actually just practice. And so it's, you know, put in together behaviors and practices that really show people that you believe what you're saying. And the same goes for the brand. You know, if you if your brand is consistent with making, you know, big statements for diversity and inclusion, great, go for it. Everyone will back you and everyone will believe you. But if your brand is not synonymous with any of that, then you, you know, you're making a mistake and you need to go back and look at your values. So yeah, for us, it's absolutely about making sure um, 
clear patterns of behavior are established in the first instance and they are kept up and people are consistent with them as they go on. Cool. Uh, cool. Um, but thank you so much. That was fantastic. Uh, lots of, Again, lots and lots of um, information there. Where can people find you? I can see Ants put it in the, uh, yeah, uh, the chat. Resetsessions.co.uk. So um, go check it out. I think really um, positive, thought provoking and, you know, wish you, you and Nick, it's, it's strange that you call him Nicholas. He's always, yeah. I've always known him as Nick. Uh, but you know all the I'm success. Not call him Nick, I feel. <laughs> yeah, well, I think you know. I think look, it's you, you we'll both amazing track record uh, of doing things. I think you're going to be achieving some amazing things, and I think it's a great kind of rallying cry to get on and let's stop talking about these things and kind of get it back to you know human values at the heart of it. You know, make sure you're delivering on what you're saying you're going to do, and actually not to be afraid and show that humility and not be afraid to make a mistake, etc. I think it's a great message to have. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, before I introduce the next speaker, I need to remember to do something. Um, Bima B is sponsored by Sony Music, The Fourth Floor Creative and Spotify. Uh, and thank you very much for your continued uh, support and involvement. Um, Sony Music have just uh, released an Alexa skill. Um, it's all around kind of making sure you can wash your hands for the appropriate amount of time. Uh, and is a great way about previewing some of the latest music on Sony, on Sony Music. So go check it out. And again, we'll put the link to that uh, in the chat uh, and also Spotify. So one of the things that we'll be doing uh, after the event is we'll be sending out a follow-up email and we'll be including links to Spotify's, uh, Spotify's Spotify for Creators platform. So this is again, continuing the great work Spotify have been doing in terms of making it easier to kind of create ads on their platform, but also support the um, creators who are kind of involved with that kind of wider ecosystem. So thanks uh, once again to Sony Music and to Spotify. So our third speaker, uh, we got Sophie all the way from uh, Scotland, um, gonna be bringing kind of bags of uh, kind of uh, passion and inspiration. Um, and Sophie, again, really interesting kind of history, um, is doing great things with her own agency in social media and the kind of digital channels. And I think um, is going to tell us a few things about where we sh what we should be doing in terms of kind of social, how we should be responding to what's kind of happening in the world right now, and how we can kind of be making good on a, a, a fearless creative attitude. So uh, Sophie, over to you and please introduce yourself. Good evening, everyone, um, from a very sunny Scotland, <laughs> which feels very strange. Um, as you can probably tell, I don't have a Scottish accent. Um, I grew up in London, um, but left the smoke, the big smoke, five years ago. And um, my background is actually in fashion marketing, and I was very, very fortunate to discover social media ten years ago, while ten, fifteen years ago, while it's still a novel. Um, experiment, I guess. No one really knew it would work. And I had the opportunity to work at the Times and Sunday Times while they were taking the print and newspapers onto iPad editions. Everyone thought we'd break with broken journalism. And then as if that wasn't enough, um, then had the opportunity to go to Dazed and Confused um, while it was still um, a monthly print publication. And they were just like, we feel like this social media thing is going to be huge. And I think that for me did so much to realize the creative potential of social media, because in those days there were no rules. There was no impressions, clicks, you know, um, shares, um, click through rate. They didn't exist. Um, we were very fortunate to just be absolutely in all respects of the word, just free to do what we wanted. So that kind of cemented my love for social media. Um, and it's funny because before I was very anti-social media. I was like, oh, this is very Orwellian, <laughs> uh, big brother, don't like this. And then the Arab Springs happened. And, you know, we saw Libya, Syria, you know, those Northern African countries. Um, and the uprising were led by social media and people are allowed to share their stories on the ground. And I just thought this tool is going to be something special. Um, but then like most of us um, got to a certain stage, early thirties, burnt out, 
So decided to just escape, come to Scotland. Um, agencies have started to discover social media because their brands wanted them, their clients wanted them. And I worked agency side, but then realized that the kind of passion that I had for social media wasn't necessarily reflected agency side, which I understand the clients pay the bills, they keep the lights on, um, you do what you need to. Um, so I thought, do you know what, Sophie, here's a crazy idea. Why don't you start your own agency? <laughs> um, that laugh of insanity right there probably shows that I didn't quite uh, anticipate what, you know, being an agency owner was, but I was very aware of the fact that there were hardly, well, in Scotland, I am the only black female agency owner. And when it comes to social media agencies, even less. So we've been running for about a year and a half. I've been very, very fortunate to work with brands um, like Maserati, um, an amazing charity here in Scotland called Tiny Changes, um, Schweppes, um, some yeah, not-for-profit um, organizations and I think for me it's all about how do we put the soul back into social media how do we capture that that spirit of wild free exploration that was there in the beginning I think you know I, I do rem you know remember that time very vividly and it was it did feel like it was a very good creative canvas is that um, you know before that you'd had to do quite a lot of build work to have a you know to execute an idea whereas now you could build it on and work with whether it was Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. So actually that gave you quite a lot of, you know, scaffolding or kind of a platform to, to, to do it. Uh, and and it, it, it was, it was, it was free uh, and it was, and it, and it was brilliant and creative. And um, I mean, do, how do you feel now when we kind of look across what's happening uh, first in America in the last few weeks and, uh, you know, now spreading across the world around kind of black lives uh, matter, you know, which is a, you know, very important, you know change and hopefully actually we've, we've we've seen as we've heard before a discussion that's been happening for some time but hopefully it feels quite different it feels that we've got a real groundswell and um, but are you excited about what's happening in uh, in terms of social media and you know clearly there's around a societal kind of change but also from social media do you think this is social media cap recapturing its uh, spirit because it feels that the leftists are quite, having quite a good go at the you know the right wing who have been dominating for the last few years, it feels that uh, the balance of power uh, and the approaches are changing. Are you, are you excited by what's happening? And, and do you feel that we, we could be returning back to a, or having a second golden age of social media? Absolutely. Um, I do look like a rebel activist yeah, <laughs> right now with my red beret at the moment, very befitting. But yeah, I think um, like all things, out of the ashes um, does come a big phoenix moment. And I think Black Lives Matter, um, without belittling what it is, couldn't have come at a better time than it has now. I mean, the movement itself um, started under President Obama, so it's been running for a long time, but was pretty much primarily just Black voices, just in the USA. But we are in the middle of a global pandemic where our regular lives have been completely disrupted. Creatives, agencies, everyone, our lives have stopped. And I think because our lives have stopped, we're suddenly like, wait, hold up. Because, you know, social media is 24 seven, but because our lives have been disrupted, we've had time to stop and really think about what's happening. And I think if this had happened at any other time, I don't think George Floyd's murder would have received the amount of global support, grand support and, we are at a really pivotal moment now. It's like everyone's attention is on this. People who perhaps before didn't recognize because all of the conversations we kept hearing was about, you know, it's your brand personality, it's about your feed aesthetic. I think a lot of people are reconnected with, actually, my social media is an extension of my voice. It's an extension of my personality, the same with brands. And I think this discovery represents a great opportunity for us as a creative industry to do what we do best, which is inspire hope for people. Yeah. No, I think there's lots of good things there. And it does feel that, you know, we heard from Hanisha earlier about how, you know, when you're scared or you've got fear, that kind of instigates change. And I think that, you know, clearly there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of upset what's happening. Um, but I think, it, you know, hopefully is, 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 
it's forcing real change. You know, there's a lot of debate. You know, we heard, we saw the Coulson statue tipped into the, you know, the, the, the harbour in Bristol. They've been debating that for years, right, about whether, you know, it should come down or not or how it should be handled. And obviously people took, you know, took matters into their hands and actually social media amplifies that. So now we have a very real, it feels, and wide discussion about, you know, those statues and, you know, how we start to confront our, you know, certainly in the UK, our history of, uh, of you know, the, of the slavers and, 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 you know, what's happened there. Uh, and and for me, you know, it feels, and you've touched on this before, about it feels that we're able, you know, social media has found instead of if like being used in a way to project a life through Instagram that you maybe can't afford, is actually we've it's it's, it's reenacted and re-enabled and, and bonded new communities in ways that it was very good at the beginning and then stopped. So it'd be interesting to see. You know, I know you feel you know passionately about this idea of community and uh, the soul and uh, 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 putting the soul back into it. It'd be interesting to hear a little bit more from you in terms of how you know creatives can really latch onto this and actually kind of run with this moment, you know, and, and actually make good on it and actually help drive change and help their, 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 their brands, whether they're an agency or an in-house team, kind of chart their way through this and uh, you know, a play an important part in positive change, but also ensure that there's a business or an organization they're doing the right things and um, engaging with their communities mm, i think our brains have all become programmed to think you know we've all heard the term digital first and i think what we need to do as a creative sector whether you're a creative director whether you're a social media manager whether you're a freelance graphic designer is you need to reshape and step out of that digital bubble. I think the digital bubble is great, but once you're in there, it's very hard to see outside of it. I think what things like Black Lives Matter, COVID-19 have done, they've disrupted our digital world. And we're suddenly thinking about things differently. And my advice to agency owners who now see their responsibilities in shaping what social media then becomes, is to look back. I mean, I love going back historically. You know, you look at um, the ancient Egyptians and hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics were one of the first forms of emojis and all they are is they're portraying stories. And I think, you know, without sounding very romanticizing the job of agencies, is I think agencies need to start doing stuff like going to art galleries, having history days in the studios, you know, watching documentaries together, I'm very fortunate to be surrounded by nature. So me and the team meet outside. And I think in doing those things, you just have an instant freshness that when it comes to creating your work, almost has no option but to just flow through it because you've shifted the energy with which you're creating. I think people are scared. I think agencies have always, you know, kind of got a brief, just work to it. And I think agencies now need to be leading brands into this new future and challenging brands. You know, I know no, none of us, you know, want to disrupt who keeps the lights on um, and the bread to our butter. But I think now agencies need to show that it's time for creativity to actually do some good. And as a result of that, you know, everything else will come. Like we saw with PG Tips and... Uh, um, Northern tea, I can't remember the name. Yorkshire of it. tea, yes. Yeah, Yorkshire tea, exactly. Water. As we saw this week, you know, they just they, yeah. they, they were just real. And because of that, they had a moment that could have been could have been planned by any campaign, any you know, social media strategy workshop. You couldn't have planned that moment. And I think brands, agencies need and creatives need to give their brands the license. Yeah to free up creativity. And I think they can do that by stepping away, going back to history, looking at what's happened in the past. I love this little book here, Century. I always flick through it. Um, and this, for example, is an image um, from the Eiffel Tower when it was being built. Now, our images of the Eiffel Tower now are all influencers taking people's pictures. But when you take that step back and you look back um, at what's happened in the past, I just think it does something to our design brain and forces us out of this almost like digital stagnation that we find ourselves in. No, I, I think you make some excellent points there and this idea that, you know, we've burst our digital bubble and that, 
you know, we've been forced to, you know, whether it's self-isolation or kind of look at things in a different way. And also I think whether we, we realize it or not, our relationship with our digital devices has probably changed in some way as much as it's very important for us, but actually, you know, and, and, and your, your example of going for a walk or spending time in nature, I think has coached us to just take time out. And actually one of the problems that we all face is that quick, 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 you've got to go quickly get things done. And I like to say, you know, you know, in order to go quickly, first you need to go slowly. Oh, yeah. you know? And I think, you know, that's been born, born out and developing these, you know, opportunities. And then, you know, in a really simple way is that, you know, you get, it, you get out what you put in. And actually, if you put the same ideas or the same nonsense, you'll get the same nonsense out. Yeah. And actually, well illustrated, new inspirations and new situations and responding to new challenges gives us new creativity. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, you've encapsulated, you know, very, you know, wonderfully well about how, um, you, you know, th this time it can be used, you know, as a positive, inspirational part to give us new things by to, you know we have to consider new things and act on them i think yeah you know it's fantastic and you know i wish you unfortunately we've got to move on to dan but you know again where can people find you uh we'll put your url in the chat but you know, also just t tell people where they can find you online where that's on twitter or instagram or your website so yeah so um you can find me um at the ms sophie and you can find the agency at let's do stuff um, and yeah. but i'll put a note in the chat so yeah. thank you everyone Awesome. And we'll be following up on our ch channels as well. But thanks so much for your time. And uh, yeah, very fetching in that red berry. It's uh, <laughs> very appropriate, but brilliant. Thank you. Awesome. So thank you. thank you so much and speak soon. Uh, so our last speaker is Dan. Dan Burgess. He uh, is, I don't know, I've, have you Dan has been a digital activist or a creative activist. Uh, and I know that you've got a, a long track record of, you know, driving change. Um, so it'd be good, I think, just to hear, you know, a few words in terms of your, 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 your interesting and varied kind of journey to now and then about how you feel we can, you know, use been, what's been happening. And we've heard three different stories, but actually, you know, how it's a great as time as any to be thinking about, you know, resetting, you know, what we're about, what we're doing and why we're doing it. So, Dan, over to you. <clears throat> thanks, Simon. And thanks to all the other um, speakers there. So much interesting stuff going on and uh, lovely to hear hear of these projects and um, yeah I guess I, I, I sort of wear sort of multiple hats and describe myself as a bit a bit of a mashup um, uh, I, I've had time in the in the sort of creative industries in the agency world I came from the music world industry originally and in late 90s into the uh, sort of startup world and then into the world of branding um, and I and I and I and I I spent a few years in agency world and then really since in the last sort of 10 to 12 years have been really sort of exploring um, um, how to use all this kind of ingenuity that we have in our sort of creative industries um, um, to sort of face into a lot of these bigger systemic challenges that are, are now sort of becoming very, very clear around us. They weren't quite so clear uh, a decade ago, but um, so I, I sort of, you know, I, 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 I'm a thinker. I, I, I sort of, like to work through the sort of head heart and hands philosophy i, I, I am a strategist um, i co-design a lot so i started i think 10 years ago called called good for nothing which was which actually was a response to the lack of um big kind of clients big brands kind of interested in 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 kind of engaging with the bigger social environmental issues so so good for nothing was a way of bringing kind of talent from the sort of commercial creative world around activism around activists around social entrepreneurs people that were kind of leaning into interesting issues in fact we, we did some work with Ugo that's where I first met Ugo many years ago and uh, um, and also how, how, do, how do we sort of co-create how do we co-design how do we work in slightly diff different ways bringing kind of unusual collaborations ar around issues and so so yeah and so I guess this role what I would you know people would call different forms of creative activism but how do we use our creativity to, to act on so for me activism really is just is just to act on something bigger than yourself something that you care deeply about, something that you believe is, is representing some form of injustice uh, or affecting the well-being, and that could be of humans or, or the non-human world, because I do a lot of work. You know, I probably the emphasis of my work in the last decade has come more from sort of ecological issues and climate issues. Um, and so I'm always very interested in how we can participate in these problems. Um, so less conventional campaigning, although I, I have done 
uh, a lot of that work, but more how do we become involved in co-creating solutions? How do we become more involved in understanding that these problems, although they seem intractable and um, insolvable, actually potentially they are maybe just sort of um, offerings. They are kind of a, a chance to transition, almost initiations, if you like, for us to move through a different way of being in this world. So. I work um, cross sectors. I still have a few brands that I work with. I'm lucky I work, I work with some of my favorite companies. Um, I do some work with Patagonia Europe. I work with the, 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 the surf brand Fidestare down in Cornwall. Uh, I'm currently working with Ecover on, um, again, looking at ways, and really with all these companies, looking at ways of how to build um, activism into kind of everyday life, really, because there is you know, all of us can be active. There are so many forms of, of activism, you know, whether it's more passive, clicking things online, whether it's putting your body on the front, on the front line uh, in protests, um, whether it's, it's using your creativity or whether it's just speaking up, you know, speaking up. And I think now is particularly at this moment where the need to speak up is becoming really, really um, uh, key for those of us with privilege, who I would imagine most people you know, employed in these sectors, I would say, have privilege, right? We all have privilege. And I think we are experiencing and seeing so many injustices in the world, whether it's um, oppression of, of, of people, like we're seeing at the moment, I mean, the poorest and most vulnerable in society, what we're seeing now with the, with the Black Lives Matter, and also the non-human world. You know, we've, we've been oppressing the kind of uh, multiple species for, for centuries. So I think now we're at this moment where all of these crises are actually interconnected and they tend to be held by a, an economic idea, which is very, very broken. So a lot of the problems I think we're talking about are kind of um, almost um, insolvable unless we kind of rethink what we put at the center of our culture, what it is that we are, we are looking to do. So I, I still work with, with businesses. I work with not-for-profits, NGOs. I work a lot with activist groups and also place-based communities. So a lot of the work I'm interested in as well is how people are starting to create the futures that they, they want. Um, and so a lot of my work is intersecting there and what's the role of, of the brand and creativity in, in this world that's emerging. So that's a bit of a, a bit of context. Wow. No, no, that's amazing. And that, you know, clearly lots been happening and I think, you know, um, there's so much to kind of, you know, to, to kind of get into there, but, you know, we just take this simple, you know, you talk about activism, it's the ability to act. And, you know, one of the things that we, we hear time and time again, and I think has been, you know, we've seen through the Black Lives Matter kind of marches and protests is a good example of this, is that we've, we, we've seen that form a new community and that's in many ways a cross community kind of grouping. But we hear, you know, from a marketing perspective, you know, Gen Z in particular, but also kind of millennial, you know, they expect businesses to be a bit more than just making money. Um, you know, they need to be doing something that they feel is good that they can then identify with. Uh, and at the same time, we've had marketeers, I think, quite clumsily trip over this idea of brand purpose and finding attaching yourself to a kind of purpose. But, you know, when I when I hear you, it, it makes me feel that, you know, if you are going to be a brand and you're going to charge more money for your brand and you're going to try and invest and grow your brand as a point of difference, is that you, by definition, you need to be heavily involved in some form of activism. Right. You, you need to stand for something. And I think, you know, we've seen it in particular, Nike is a very good example of that with the campaign that they did. I mean, they've done it for a number of years, but doing with Colin Kaepernick. And then obviously in kind of recent weeks, um, and apologies for, to Colin for getting his name wrong. But, um, you know, for me, you know, it is a key takeout that, you know, businesses and brands have got to stand for something or they stand for nothing and then they, they will just be lost. I mean, would you agree with that? Do you think that's a great starting point for all of us? You know, no matter what we're doing, that that's one of the things we should be insisting on. Yeah, yeah I think I think absolutely. I mean, it, you know, we're, we're sort of we are living in a, a very, very complex time of, uh, of of the sort of, you know, where humanity is at such a such a interesting place. And it's scary. And, um, you know, we're trying to support still and prop up systems and structures that demand infinite growth and uh, massive consumption of materials and we're seeing how damaging that is and we're seeing what might be the new alternative might look like. But unfortunately, there's going to be the transition, I believe, it's going, you know, it's going to be uncomfortable and there are, um, there are going to be some things that we're gonna to have to let go of. Those are gonna be beliefs, behaviors, products, businesses, 
Um, it's just not possible for us to continue on this, this trajectory. And so I think as a business or a brand right now, I think if you ask anybody within who's working with an organization, and someone, you, I think you talked about the inside out piece, and it's a, it's a methodology that I've always used when I've worked with businesses is that you, you, you very much start absolutely like what is the company feeling like what as human as human beings every business right now every employee is going to have a kind of a bunch of different things which they're holding to be important right now it's particularly as we see all these these issues literally unraveling almost by the week at the moment um, and I think you need to start from there and then you need to start to what does it there's a sort of combination of what, what are we feeling as an organization what does the planet really need right now and what are our customers, how are our customers thinking about the world as well? And I think you're looking for something in these, through these different, through those three lenses to find, to find something that can speak to those different requirements. Um, and I, I, yeah, I, I certainly believe that, um, you know, we're, we're, people are experiencing, you know, I think there's a, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of emotion, um, there's a lot of heart uh, 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 sort of st starting. I think people are starting to sort of in, 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 in their bodies almost feel uh, the uncomfort of sort of where we're at in the world. And I would encourage that that way of starting to work within organizations. So I think we have to work much more from a, a place of intuition and empathy and and actually listening more now to how our staff are feeling, how our customers and stakeholders and communities are feeling and maybe work from there rather than trying to rush in with the the next solution like what what is what is being called for now so i think there's a but i think absolutely we you know i think with with the 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 evolution the speed of evolution that's going to be required to stay relevant in the world we face now i think you have to be very very um grounded in some form of deeper meaning and authenticity to, to your work no and i think you know that kind of chimes with you know what we've heard from our other three speakers as well is that I think authenticity is often overused, um, but I think it's really important. And actually it's finding, if you like, your core values or understanding, you know, how to be authentic rather than just learning something to fake it, which I know is an oxymoron, but actually, you, you know, just having that kind of you know, power and self-belief to, to just authentically kind of be, I think is important. And that you know, if, if we are working for a brand, I think that will kind of translate through you know, we mentioned Ben and Jerry's, you know, Ben and Jerry's have a rich history of supporting, you know, the black community and also, you know, being active in this kind of area. So when they released what was a very powerful statement, you know, people, yeah, totally respect that. That's, that's consistent with your own values. Uh, and I think that's something that we're kind of starting to, I think, see is here is businesses having to find what they really believe in and kind of what they do. And um, before we wrap it up, I've got a, you know, a, a, a while all of this is very inspiring for some people, it might feel that it's just the, you know, the world is ending and I can't cope or I'm never going to be able to kind of keep up with this. So I think it would be good just, you know, hear from you uh, some advice, for example, you know, I'm a creative, a creator, I want to make a difference. You know, what are the ways in which I can apply my, you know, passion and skill to kind of do, you know, to do the right thing. And also, um, you know, find the areas that I want to be active in and make a difference. Yeah, I mean, I think there's plenty of things. I mean, there's a there's a great initiative that you might be aware of within the sort of creative sectors um, run by the guys, the Purpose Disruptors and Jonathan Wise. They've been developing a whole way of looking at reset from a kind of industry perspective. What does this what has this big pause shown us? What what have we what have we learned through this this kind of moment of reflection? What have we experienced? that we want to, you know, we want to hold on to and what are we willing to let go of? And so I would tap into that, to what is going on with them, because I think they're really going to be trying to engage people across the creative sector in terms of building um, a, a new way of showing up, you know, around this reset. Um, I think there are so many amazing things going on at the grassroots. You've seen how people are self-organizing, whether that's in cities, in towns, there are kind of activist groups, there are small NGOs, there are social entrepreneurs, there are community groups. Um, I would, as you know, that's where I would be channeling creativity right now. Where, how can we sustain uh, these brands? Can we bring our brands into these spaces? Can we rethink like what is, what really matters to people right now? Because I think it's great having a, a you know, a, you know these, these purposeful belief systems, but where, where, where are we really being served? And I think we have to try and find ways to bring the most vulnerable into this reset because if we don't listen and try and design around those who've sort of been ignored to now 
we're going to just hit another collapse in not far down the line. So I would just say there's a lot out there and, and create, you know, creativity is, you know, we are facing the biggest creative challenges we've ever faced as a species. So, you know, it, this is for, this is our time, people who work in creativity. Um, and I said, just experiment and be prepared to, to uh, think, you know, it was spoken to, I think Hanish has said, you know, the vulnerability is okay not to know as well. It's okay not to have the answers right now, but let's just start experimenting. Amazing. I think lots of fantastic advice there and that, uh, you know, we've, we've heard it as when, you know, obviously with COVID-19, you know, it's a, a tragic, you know, situation and we shouldn't forget all the people that have lost their lives within that. But I think that, you know, it's also forced us to kind of look at things differently and take that time out. And I think it was really interesting last Tuesday, Blackout Tuesday, where actually that was, it was, you know, it's a time to reflect and to listen. Actually, instead of automatically trying to come up with the right answer, which is, a, you know, often a, a way of, if you like, a leadership style, which now seems quite antiquated, is listen, you know, find out what's required and then ask yourselves, you know, how can I help or how can I help here? And then kind of do that. So I think lots of great material for the reset theme. And, uh, you know, we'll be, it almost feels that we've, so, we've got so much great material in this kind of hour that we, this is our agenda for the next, um, you know, next six to six to, you know, nine months with Bema, with Bema Beat, um, which is me making up policy on the hoof. But I think, you know, it does feel that, you know, creativity is going to be, is, you know, it's a, it's a an inherently human trait right creativity and actually you know we've to your point completely we've never needed it more and there's plenty of challenges for us to address and so i think about how we kind of come together as a community and you know clearly bima is playing an important role in that and that we you know want to you know make our oh, creative council is all about showcasing really great ideas from a, a from a wide variety and diversity of sources as well and so if you're, you're sat at home and you're watching this and you want to submit some work, please do. You know, if you want to join a council, you get involved, please do. You know, check out all the links that we're sharing. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a scary time. But as we've heard, that's a good thing, right? You know, the best comes when we're scared. So uh, I think hopefully we'll see lots of kind of things coming out of this. So Dan, I don't know if you've got a, a final uh, word to kind of end it and then I'll, you know, kind of wrap up. But uh, yeah, just like you said, on the, on the edges of fear is possibility. And it's often our fear of the unknown and the not knowing that holds us back. But actually, there's a huge creative potential when we're on those edges of uncertainty. And so, you know, the Latin word or the French word for heart is uh, for courage comes from cur, heart. And that's a very creative thing. So I think, you know, let's let's work work from there and uh, and, and just lean into that uncertainty and, and and let's see where we get to. Amazing. No, very good honest advice and you know very inspiring so i'd like to thank all our four speakers you've been amazing um apologies for not quite managing the time but i think lots of kind of rich conversation here and really great to hear from all of you um so that concludes our uh, session and unless i get a little note um we'll kind of wrap it up um but lots in the chat here in terms of links um please check those out um kind of links to all our speakers uh, the Beamer Beat channels. A big thank you to Spotify and Sony Music for your continued support. And uh, really just wish you, you know, stay safe, but also um, let's use this time productively and let's be inspired and let's kind of see creativity as one of the big answers that we've got for moving forwards. So thank you very much.